Welcome to the MacArthur Memorial Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Williams. Join me as we explore the life and legacy of General of the Army Douglas MacArthur and discuss a wide range of military history topics from the American Civil War to the Korean War. In February 2024, the MacArthur Memorial hosted an event to mark the 125th anniversary of the Philippine-American War. This event was in partnership with the Hampton Roads chapter of the Filipino-American National Historical Society and the Council of United Filipino Organizations of Tidewater. The event featured presentations by several scholars on different aspects of the war. This episode features a lecture by Dwight Sullivan on the capture of Emilio Aguinaldo. Our final speaker today is Dwight Sullivan, a lawyer and an adjunct faculty member at George Washington University Law School. He is also the author of Capturing Aguinaldo, the Daring Raid to Seize the Philippine President at the Dawn of the American Century. So let's go back 123 years to February 3rd, 1901. So it's the second anniversary of the beginning of the Philippine-American War. As you see from the front page of the Virginian pilot, the news of the day was dominated by the recent death of Queen Victoria after more than six decades on the British throne. In the United States, the president was William McKinley. The vice president-elect was Theodore Roosevelt. Remember that until 1937, the inauguration didn't happen until March. The American flag had 45 stars. The 45th star was added five years before when Utah was admitted to the Union and Cadet Douglas MacArthur was a yearling at West Point. Now, let's go back to that front page of the Virginian pilot. And there, next to an illustration of Queen Victoria's mausoleum, and right below an article about the Boer War in in, um, South Africa, is a dispatch about the Philippine-American War, reporting on a skirmish in which five American soldiers were killed, four wounded, and two missing in action. Now, this, now, remember that in November of 1899, the conventional aspect of the war, the Philippine-American War, had ended. And on that day, Arthur MacArthur, in the field, commanding the 2nd Division, sent a message back to headquarters. So this is November 23rd, 1899. And he said, the so-called Filipino Republic is destroyed. The Congress is dissolved. The president of the the so-called republic is a fugitive. The generals are separated without any means of conference or concerted action. The authority under which an army was kept in the field no longer exists. The army itself as an organization has disappeared. But as we saw from that article on the front page of the Virginian pilot, this assessment of Aguinaldo and the Philippine fight for independence those proved more resilient uh, than was in- anticipated at the time. And from November of 1899, recall that at that point, uh, Aguinaldo slipped through a, a cordon. There was an American pincer movement that was closing, and it didn't close on time. And Aguinaldo slipped through. And since then, since November of 1899, no American knew where he was. But that changed on February 9th of 1901. There was a 24th Infantry Detachment at a remote outpost, and there were seven insurrectos that surrendered to them, along with some correspondence. And that led that outpost to send a dispatch to headquarters of the 4th District that said uh, that surrendered insurgents and correspondence they carried reliably indicated that Aguinaldo was in Palanan with 100 armed men. And the commanding general of the 4th District who received that report was Frederick Funston. Now, Frederick Funston was five foot four inches tall. He was a diminutive dynamo. Uh, He was the son of a congressman. He was a University of Kansas dropout, and he was an inveterate adventurer. He'd participated in botanical expeditions to climatic extremes, both in Death Valley and in the Yukon. Uh, For 17 months, he was an artillery officer with the Cuban revolutionaries fighting against Spain uh, for independence. When the military buildup for the Spanish-American War began, he was appointed as the commanding, uh, as the commander, regimental commander of the 20th Kansas. And the 20th Kansas went to Philipp- the Philippines, but it arrived too late for the war with Spain. 
but soon fight, found itself fighting against the Americans' former allies, the Philippine independence forces under Emilio Aguinaldo. Uh, both Funston and the 20th Kansas proved particularly adept at combat. In fact, Funston was awarded a Medal of Honor for a bold cross-river attack that turned the enemy flank in, during a particular significant campaign. So Funston says, hey, send the courier that was carrying this correspondence along with that correspondence to my headquarters in San Ysidro. And so here's one of the letters that that courier was carrying. And as you can see, it's a combination of Spanish and a cipher that combined numbers and mathematical symbols. And uh, Funston assigned the task of deciphering that correspondence to Lazaro Segovia. Segovia was a native of Spain. He'd gone to the Philippines to fight with Spain against the Philippine Revolution. After that war ended, he joined the Philippine revolutionaries in their fight against the United States. But 15 months in, he switched sides and he joined the United States. He worked for Funston as both a scout and an intelligence asset. And for three hours, he labored over that uh, ciphered correspondence. And then he shouted, Yala Tengo. He'd broken the code. And they were able to quickly decipher um, the correspondence. And, they, and the, the correspondence did indicate that Aguinaldo was in Palana, up there in Isabella province. Um, and in one of these letters, this was particularly important, he asked his cousin, General Balderamo um, Aguinaldo, to send him 400 reinforcements. And the letter said that, the, that uh, Cecilio uh, Segismundo, who was his courier, would lead those reinforcements back to his headquarters in Palana. Um, so Funston pondered what he'd learned there. And the next day he met with Segismundo and he ran by various uh, strategies to try to capture Aguinaldo. First, he said, well, you know, the U.S. Navy could go up the coast uh, and then there could be a lightning raid and they could seize him. And Segismundo said it'll never work. There, there are native tribes that live along the coast. They would alert uh, the uh, Aguinaldo and Palanon uh, before any U.S. soldiers were able to get there. And then, then Funston said, well, what about a, a, a march up through the, the center of Luzon and go to Pawn on that way? And he was told that wouldn't work. There was only one mountain pass. And it was very closely guarded. And then Funston came up with a very elaborate Trojan horse campaign. He said, OK, Aguinaldo is expecting reinforcements. What if we provide those reinforcements with Philippine soldiers that are loyal to the United States? We can have some U.S. Army officers, of course, including Funston himself, accompanying them, pretending to be Army privates who had been captured in a battle. And then they would be welcomed into the enemy headquarters. And Segismundo heard that idea and he said, you know, I think that might work. Now, Emilio Aguinaldo would later claim that Segismundo had been subjected to, to uh, uh, two administrations of the water cure in order to uh, win his cooperation. Now, the water cure, it was used quite often uh, by U.S. soldiers uh, in, in, as a means of extracting intelligence and information in the Philippines. One American soldier wrote this description in a letter home. Now, this is the way we give them the water cure. Lay them on their backs, a man standing on each hand and each foot, then put a round stick in the mouth and pour a pail of water in the mouth and nose. And if they don't give up, pour in another pail. They swell up like toads. I'll tell you, it's a terrible torture. And sometimes that was uh, augmented by kneeling or putting a rifle butt into the individual's stomach so they would spit out the water and administer another uh, a dose. And sometimes it was made even more excruciating by using salt water. Uh, but this is all, it was almost certainly not true that Segismundo had been subjected to the water cure. Uh, both uh, a private diary entry by an American author, uh, American officer who was there, uh, and personal correspondence written with no apparent motive to fabricate indicates that Segismundo voluntarily cooperated with the Americans in this unit. So Funston then went to Manila and he briefed his um, the commanding general of the Department of Northern Luzon, Lloyd Wheaton, and the uh, military uh, the military governor of uh, the Philippines, Arthur MacArthur. He briefed them on their plan. MacArthur enthusiastically agreed to it. He left the details to his subordinates, but he insisted on one operational detail. Aguinaldo must be captured alive. 
And so then the, the, recall that this depended upon having some uh, Philippine soldiers that were loyal to the United States participate in the operation. Um, well, a company of uh, Maka babies were, were chosen to play that role. The Maka babies had aligned themselves with Spain uh, during the initial Philippine Revolution. And when the uh, war of the United States against the Philippine nationalists commenced, the Maka babies switched their alliance to the United States. Uh, company D, the, these, these men are from Company D, 1st Battalion, Maka Baby Scouts. They were designated as the unit that would participate in this, but they weren't told what their mission was. Um, the unit was commanded by two American officers. This is Lieutenant uh, Oliver Perry Morton Hazard, better known as Happy Hazard. He and his older brother, Russell, were the American, uh, American commanding officers of this unit. So they were detailed to participate in the unit as well. Uh, Funston also chose his cousin, Lieutenant Burt Mitchell, to, to in, uh, be part of the campaign. And the final American officer would be, um, would be Harry Newton, who had earlier led an amphibious raid in Casigoran, a town that would be important to their mission. Uh, Funston also chose to take along several Filipinos to play the roles of the, um, of the officers of that reinforcement unit. Uh, that's actually Segovia on on the on the far side of the of the uh, of the picture, um, second from your left is uh, is Segus Mundo. Um, in the middle is uh, Hilario Talplacido, who played the role of the commanding officer. He would be particularly significant in the campaign. Now, um, as you see the, from this topographical map, the the northeast coast of the Philippines is particularly rugged territory. And it's protected from most of the of the rest of Luzon by the Sierra Madres mountain range. So it, it, there couldn't be a march from San Ysidro uh, to Palanan. So part of the part of the mission was to have the U.S. Navy deliver the expeditionary force somewhere near Casagoran Bay. And then from there, it would it would make the 60 mile march uh, to Palanan. So um, Admiral George Remy was asked to detail a ship. And he provided USS Vicksburg, an Annapolis-class gunboat, to be the ship that would take this expeditionary force close enough to conduct its mission. Uh, these are the officers of Vicksburg. Uh, seated in the middle is Commander uh, Edward Barry, who was the commanding, who was the captain of the ship. Uh, not pictured is the first sergeant of the Marine Detachment, an Irish immigrant named Daniel Sullivan, who is my paternal grandfather. All right. Um, so once the ship got underway. There was a mission brief. Most of the people that were on the ship had no idea what, what their mission was until they got underway. And then there was a mission group. And the Maka babies expressed extreme agitation after the mission brief. They did not think the plan was work. They were convinced that those, uh, that those uh, uh, officers, the, 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 the former uh, Philippine revolutionaries, would betray them, uh, and they didn't want to go. But then their first sergeant, Pedro Bustos, who's, who's there on the left of the photo, um, Funston called him a little shriveled old man, but with the heart of a lion. And he slapped his chest and said, I can't speak for the others, my general, but as for me, I'm a soldier of the United States. And then with that, the planning got underway. Um, so one of the things that was required was to make the Maka babies look like insurrectos. And so they were issued new, they were issued clothing that had been um, that had been seized from Filipino units. They were issued an assortment of uh, Mausers and, and Remingtons. And then this is what they looked like uh, after they'd been uh, transformed aboard Vicksburg. But once the ship got underway, nothing went right. The weather was very rough. The seas were rough. There was an epidemic of seasickness. Uh, Vicksburg ran aground at one point on the eastern shore, um, on the east, along the eastern coast, which delayed the mission. Um, there was a plan that they would get native boats, they would get bancas uh, that, that the expeditionary force would transfer to at sea and then take those bancas to Casagoran. They were able to buy three bancas in Polilo Island along with a, a supply of rice that they would use as their food on the expedition. Those are the three bancas that they purchased. All three of them sank in rough seas. So nothing was going right. Um, finally, uh, USS Vicksburg goes into Casagoran Bay and it drops off the um, the expeditionary force ten miles inside the inside the bay, and from this point until the end of the operation, they were on their own. Funston and his expeditionary force were on their own. They had no way of communicating with the Americans, um, and they knew. Remember, they were behind enemy lines, wearing uh, false uniforms. They knew that if they were captured, 
in all likelihood, they would be shot as spies. Uh, so the, the plan had to be changed because the, 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 uh, they didn't have the banca. So first they had a 20 mile march to get to Casa Gorin. Uh, when they got to the town, three important things happened. First, uh, the ruse worked. Uh, they were accepted as a native, as, as a Philippine army unit with these five Americans as POWs. Um, the facade worked. Uh, secondly, um, they had uh, dispatches, uh, correspondence to Aguinaldo. About four months before this, just in, in a routine patrol, Funston, even though he was a brigadier general, he liked to go out on patrols, and he was a field general. In a routine patrol, they'd stumbled across uh, General uh, Urbano, Urbano Le, uh, Lecano's um, uh, headquarters. And uh, Lacano was able to get away, but they seized some letterhead, some of his Brigada Lacano letterhead. And one of the people in, in Funston's headquarters uh, forged uh, the general's signature uh, on this on this stationery. And then they wrote up uh, a letter to Aguinaldo telling him that uh, he had dispatched this company of reinforcements, um, uh, company of reinforcements uh, to Palanan. Also, uh, Tal Placido signed a letter that described this fictitious firefight in which the unit had captured five Americans. And they got a runner to take these up to Palan on ahead of them uh, so that there, there wouldn't be alarm when this unit started approaching them um, with these five Americans uh, included within it. So that was the second significant thing that happened. The third significant thing is they needed to replace their food supply. Remember, their food supply sank with the bank, with the bancos. And so they tried to gather up food, but there wasn't much rice in the area. Most people in that, in that area um, subsisted on on fish and sweet potatoes. They had a hard time gathering food, and when they finally set out on their mission, uh, they, they, it was there was a pre planned rendezvous time with Vicksburg because um, remember they were out of communication, so they they had a timetable. They had to be done by by March twenty fifth because that's when Vicksburg was going to pull in a plot on Bay. Um, when they set out, they had insufficient food, and then the first night. A lot of the food that they brought was pilfered, including a number of the chickens that they had brought along with them. And so uh, Segovia had to had to essentially lead the unit because Funston couldn't do it because he was supposed to be a POW. And they had 12 um, uh, pack bearers from Casagoran with them. So they needed to maintain the charade as they marched that 60 mile march uh, up the coast. And uh, so the first night, a lot of the food was pilfered. And so uh, Segovia looked at the food and he said, you know, we, we only have enough for quarter rations for this six day march. So, so the men were reduced to eating one quarter of what they would normally eat while they were undergoing extreme physical exertion. Uh, the, the east coast of Luzon is very mountainous. They had to go up mountain slopes, down mountain slopes. They had to repeatedly cross streams that were swollen because it was, it was raining the entire time they were there. Funston said that the rain turned what was left of their food into a fermented, soggy mass. And so, so this is what they faced when, as, they were, as they were executing this mission, making this arduous, uh, uh, arduous trip. It's only 60 miles as the Philippine Eagle flies between Casiguran and Palanan, but because of the rough terrain, it was a 90-mile uh, hike. So finally, finally on the sixth day, the, the men are down to their final morsels of food. They're exhausted. And finally, they come to a Philippine army outpost that's only eight miles from Palana. And they get in there um, and, and the ruse had worked. Remember, the correspondence had gone up that had earlier explained what was happening. And so instructions had been left at that outpost to separate the American POWs from the, from the Philippine soldiers and to send the Philippine reinforcements to Palana. So this resulted in the Americans being separated from the rest of the expeditionary force during the final battle uh, that would that would occur. So the next morning after uh, after some food had been sent down from Palanan, um, the expedition began that final eight mile march. And, and let me mention the previous day, the day they got to the outpost, it was Emilio Aguinaldo's 32nd birthday. And there was enormous feast and celebration in Palanan. So the next day, uh, the expeditionary force, the Maccabees, under the leadership of Segovia, marches the final eight miles. They get to a river, they cross the river, and the plan worked. They were welcomed as brothers in arms. Uh, the Maccabees scouts were, were uh, put at the position of attention. 
Uh, and then at the crucial moment, an order was given to fire an oblique volley into the presidential guard. Now, remarkably, only two presidential guardsmen were killed, but the rest uh, fled, most of them dropping their weapons. Uh, there was a, a short gunfight in, in, uh, in, in, in Aguinaldo's headquarters. There's Aguinaldo's headquarters building. There was a short gunfight there, and Segovia twice shot uh, Colonel Villa, who was the chief of staff of Aguinaldo. And then uh, Hilario Talpacido, who until then had, had, he wasn't a great marcher. Maccababies actually had to carry him on that march up the coast. Uh, but at the crucial moment, he's the person that physically restrained Aguinaldo and said, you are a prisoner of the Americans. Uh, now, the, the Americans had missed the battle. Uh, they, by the time they arrived, uh, the, battle, the battle was over. Uh, but they still had to wait two days until their planned rendezvous um, with USS Vicksburg. And they spent most of the time uh, taking celebratory photos in Palanon with a Kodak camera that, uh, that, um, uh, that Burt Mitchell had brought along with him. Um, and then finally, when USS Vick Vicksburg arrived, when, uh, when General Aguinaldo boarded the ship, he did so no longer as the president of the Philippine Republic, but as a prisoner of war. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you have questions, suggestions, or comments, we want to hear from you. You can find us on Twitter at MacArthur1880, on Facebook as the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial, or you can email MacArthur Memorial at norfolk.gov.